So um, what was the goal, do you think, of Minds on the Edge? In other words, what do you feel uh, that this program demonstrates? It's a really new, like I said, it's a role-playing kind of situation. What do you think that demonstrates to people? One of the goals, there are many goals from this program, but it was really to get the word out about the nature of serious mental illness, many of the difficulties associated with access to access for care, for example. The first scenario, Olivia, college student, could be any of our children. College student, she's away. She's starting to have difficulties showing signs of bipolar disorder, some mania, some psychosis. What do you do? What does the professor do? What does the parent do? And all the scenarios around that of helplessness and, and um, how do you get care to someone that doesn't think that they need care? So you can imagine all um, the discussions that come into play there. And then the second scenario about a person with chronic mental illness that actually might want help, might not want help, and how do you actually put all the pieces together so the person gets the help they need. So the goal was to help decrease stigma, to educate the public. We really want this to get out to not only people that are providers of mental health services, but the general population, police officers, legislators, it's very important. Because it truly is a diverse group that co can come in contact with someone experiencing these mental health issues, and that's what comes out on the panel. There's a really variety of you know, different experts that can come in contact with this situation, the justice, you mm -hmm. know, and that sort of thing, which is really interesting. Um, which panelists had the most impact on your way of thinking, if any? I mean, who really changed your mind mm -hmm. about something? In your experience on the program? All of the panelists had such unique perspectives and really the program could have gone on for many, many more hours. Um, there's so many things. I've watched it myself many times now and each time I'm left thinking, I, I, le I learn a new thing, I take away a new point. Um, everybody had something really important to say. The people that struck me probably the most were the, the two the parents, which were Peter Early and Eval Gordley. Both are parents in real life of people with serious mental illness. Um, and Avell also is uh, a senator in Oregon and a professor, but to see, have them talk about how horribly difficult it is to have an adult child with serious mental illness and not be able to get them the care that they need and to go through that pain, uh, it really sticks with me. And having been in a situation where I'm in an office with a, a young man with schizophrenia and have the parents there who are crying and desperate and thinking this is the end of the world and what are we gonna do, I've, been, I've seen that. Mm -hmm. And if you've experienced it, you know that you wanna do whatever you can to help. That's one of the beauties of our agency is when we're sitting with a, a family like that and the person with schizophrenia and say, you know what? I'm so sorry that you're going through this, but we can help you. Mm -hmm. And to really mean it, and I know that I have the backing of an incredible agency that will help provide services that that person needs and the family needs as well. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like you say on the panel, your biggest asset is you know, having empathy for the person that you're talking to, you say you know, having compassion and really treating that person with respect. I know that you mentioned that on the panel, that mm -hmm. seems to be a really important point. That is such an important piece. I mean, these people with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, these are neurobiological disorders. They're brain disorders. So it's not a situation of, you know, put your, pull yourself up by the bootstraps or a weakness of character. However, it's not that simple either. Um, it, the brain is not a kidney, you know. Um, and as Dr. Kandel points out so beautifully on the panel, this is a very complicated organ. You know, your, your brain, all your cognitive functions, how you perceive the universe, how you express yourself to the world, it's all through your brain. So it's not as simple as, oh, you have this illness, let's prescribe you a pill. There's so much more that goes with it and the relationship really is key. Mm -hmm. And not to mention it's the driving force of all your social relationships and everything you do. Absolutely. So, um, and what new idea do you think you came away from this program with? Was there something new that you hadn't thought of before or that someone taught you at the panel? Was there anything new that you hadn't thought about before? Well, I think the biggest thing for me was t it, it stimulated my excitement of getting involved in a bigger level. Because I think what we do at Greater Cincinnati is fantastic and people need to know more about that. But I'm ready to take it to a bigger level, whether it's taking it you know, to Columbus and taking it national. Because we happen to do things quite well we can always get better, but there's many of my colleagues across the country that will say to me, how, do, how does your PATH team work that you can actually go and find people that are living outside and help give them services? How do you get people into housing? What do you mean that when you actually have a person in the hospital, you communicate with the hospital doctors? How does that work and tell us more? So educating and helping make a system. Um, uh, Estelle Richmond points out, she said, you know, it's really not, th there is no system. We talk about a mental health system and she said it's, it's really stuck together by bu bubble gum. Mm -hmm. That was telling also because P 
people in different parts of the country do it different ways, and maybe we need to have more discussion of how we could um, make things a lot better, mm -hmm. a lot more streamlined. A little less disjointed. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, you told us a little bit about what you do and how your organization has really kind of innovative programs, and you have sort of structures that are a little bit more kind of forward thinking than what other parts of the country might be experiencing. So, what, but what could you say to someone out there that's watching this, that thinks to themselves, what's the first step? You know, how would I, would I just contact Greater Cincinnati Behavioral Health Services? How can I reach out for help? What would you say mm -hmm. to someone out there watching? Well, first of all, you're making the, the, the first step is to be realizing that you need some kind of help and that there is help out there for you. Um, try to access that, whether in call any of the agencies. There are different rules and regulations of how you get in, and we have to go through mental health access point, for example. But even if you call our agency, somebody will give you information of how you can get your needs met. Um, but to come out and not be ashamed or embarrassed of having mental illness, again, as Dr. Kandel points out, why are people um, so reluctant to come forward when they have a brain disorder when you wouldn't feel that same way if you had a heart disease or cancer? Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for this discussion, Dr. Scale. I really appreciate you coming in today, and I think the program is a very good educational program. So I'm glad you got to be a part of it. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you so much. For CET Connect, I'm Amanda Carnes. Thanks for watching.